Hello and welcome to the ceremony honoring the, uh, this year's recipient of the Gilbert F. White Award. I'm Seth Stein, president of the Natural Hazards Section, and uh, it's my honor to preside here. The Gilbert White Award and lecture recognize original contribution to the basic knowledge of natural hazards and disaster risks. The award honors the life and work of Gilbert White, an AGU fellow who was internationally known for contributions to natural hazards research and floodplain management. The award can honor people for contributions to understanding natural hazards or to reducing the risks they pose to society. The ideal recipient will have done both. This year, the selection committee considered an exceptional set of nominees and selected Dr. Augusto Neri. The award recognizes his pioneering sustained research that revolutionized understanding of eruption dynamics and vital global contributions to hazard mitigation. Dr. Neri is director of volcano research of the Instituto Nacional de Geofisica y Volcanologica, the INGV, in Pisa, Italy. His major contributions have been in developing analytical and numerical models that simulate previously interactable, complex, and often time-dependent features of large explosive eruptions. His research over many decades epitomizes outstanding distinction in the application of computational fluid dynamics to solve volcanic hazard problems that are vital uh, for hazard mitigation. His record of highly cited research papers is a proof of his influence, as are the global applications of the methods he's developed for mitigation. His great talent is the insight into transient and unsteady processes during volcanic eruptions. He's the leader in the move away from time average 1D and 2D models to codes incorporating transient effects such as unsteady flow, partial collapses of otherwise buoyant plumes, and ephemeral predictions of proximal tephra sedimentation. In the 1990s, his powerful partnerships with Flavio Dobran and Giovanni Macedonio transformed axisymmetric models for the dynamics of large, both steady and unsteady eruption plumes. Those are Plinian and Ignimbrite forming eruptions. Subsequent work incorporated introduction of multiple sizes of entrained particles, partial collapse of eruption plumes, and the development of 3D codes. Much of this research used Vesuvius as a test bed both because of the superb documentation of the previous eruptions that offers a check for simulations, and because of the clear need to mitigate future large eruptions that threaten the surrounding communities. His subsequent partnerships with his students Tommaso Angaro and Sara Barsotti have used parallel computing to produce groundbreaking 3D and 4D simulations of eruptions. They have also developed a highly cited numerical model for TEFR disposal, which solves for both particle transport and particle sedimentation. This is in current use by the Icelandic Meteorological Office for studying eruptions throughout Iceland. In parallel, he's an initiator and lead player in the development and characterization of impulsive, transient, and dome-hosted eruptions and volcanic blasts that overturned our previous understanding of the lethal Mount St. Helens blast. A significant part of his research spans the bridge from computational modeling to hazard mitigation in the field. He has played a key role in major eruption crises, all major eruption crises in Italy, Etna, Stromboli, Campo Fuegri, and other countries, including Sofria Hills in Montserrat, in Alaska, uh, in Indonesia, in Iceland, Santorini in Greece, and Cabuco in Chile. He also led the Italian contribution to international teams, pioneering innovative approaches to probabilistic assessment of hazard and risk. Neri has built a globally recognized research group in Pisa. His, international, his successful graduate students and postdoctoral fellows have gone on to strong independent careers, indicating his superb abilities as a generous mentor. In summary, Augusto Neri is an outstanding quantitative research scientist of international stature who is bold and innovative in his research, who has brought a unique contribution of physics and fluid dynamics into the mainstream of volcanic hazard mitigation. The value of his contributions is confirmed by the EGU awarding him the 2016 Sol Soloviev Medal, the Italian government offering him the Protezione Civili Medal for contributions during the Etna eruption and his election as an honorary fellow of the GSA. He is a perfect choice for the Gilbert White Award, and I think we all look forward to hearing his lecture. Congratulations, Dr. Neri. Hello, everyone. First of all, uh, I, I wish to start my talk um, warmly thanking the Gilbert White uh, Award Committee for giving me uh, such an honor and opportunity today. Uh, my presentation will be about modeling, explosive eruption dynamic and hazard. I will uh, illustrate some advances we have carried out uh, in the last several 
uh, years. And uh, I will also mention some future challenges we had ahead. And uh, I also want to, uh, since now, acknowledge um, fundamental contribution to this work by many colleagues uh, at INGV and, uh, and uh, international. Okay, let's start from the problem. We are dealing with the volcanic risk. Volcanic risk, it's a, a main issue in many uh, regions of the world. Uh, we assume that we have uh, uh, about uh, 1,500 active volcanoes in the world. I mean, uh, uh, that have been active in the Holocene and uh, about 600 of them have been uh, historically active. Uh, I mean, uh, that they have erupted the uh, post-1500 AD. And uh, we all know that uh, volcanoes are mostly located uh, um, along the boundaries uh, of the continental and the oceanic place. But the main problem is that uh, many of these areas are also densely uh, inhabited. And uh, right now we estimate that about uh, 800 million people, that means uh, about 10% of the total population, live uh, within uh, a distance of 100 kilometers from active volcanoes. An additional problem is that just a small part of uh, the population exposed has actually experienced uh, volcanic eruption. So that means that there is no real memory of volcanic uh, phenomena. And the third major problem dealing with volcanic risk uh, that is that uh, there are volcanic systems that have uh, a, an impact, a potential impact uh, that is not only relevant at the regional level or at the national level, but they could have a global, uh, a global impact. And this is something that of course affects the whole planet. Uh, so the challenge that we have uh, is to understand the dynamics of the explosive eruption and with that also to be able to provide useful information in the assessment of their hazard. Understanding the dynamics and assess the hazard continue to represent challenging issue of present day volcanological community. And of course, we cannot really effectively mitigate the hazard without understanding them. So these two main challenges, challenges are of course closely related. And this challenge is mostly due to the complex nature of the phenomena and also to the significant variability and the unpredictability of volcanic processes. Um, many insight uh, on the dynamics of explosive eruption have been gained uh, by two, uh, for instance, uh, by two uh, main eruption, main explosive eruption uh, that occurred uh, in the last few decades. Uh, during these two eruption, I'm talking about uh, the 1980 Mount St. Helen eruption and the 1991 Mount Pilantubo, Philippine eruption, uh, there were two eruptions where uh, we were able to make quite a detailed and close observation of such complex processes. On the left, you see a, a picture of the underexpanded volcanic jet of the Mount St. Helens eruption. On the right, you see the almost 40 kilometer high uh, Plinian column of Mount Pinatubo eruption. Since from these two picture, we can really appreciate the complex and strongly turbulent nature of such uh, processes, as well as the, 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 the very large temporal and the spatial sky, scales that are involved in the volcanic phenomena. But these two uh, eruption were also um, provided also several surprises uh, to volcanologists. Uh, with respect to Mount St. Helens, a, a main surprise at that time uh, was represented by the by the, by the occurrence of the lateral blast that was uh, uh, initiated by a, a, a flank failure uh, of the volcano. So instead of uh, producing a vertical jet, uh, the, the, the eruption, the explosive eruption started with this uh, a, a powerful uh, lateral blast that produced uh, a major Pyroclastic density, den uh, pyroclastic density currents that are this very fast uh, uh, and dense, high temperature flow, 
that in that case was able to devastate a large part uh, of the area, an area estimated about uh, uh, of 600 square kilometer. And uh, that PDC was extremely destructive. Uh, uh, on, on the bottom left-hand side picture, you see the effect of that blast uh, with the blowdown of uh, uh, thousands and thousands of, uh, of trees. And uh, we also, um, uh, that eruption also uh, uh, caused uh, 57 people that die, but uh, that actually was uh, quite a lucky circumstances since uh, the balance uh, could have been much worse if the same event could be happened, uh, for instance, one day later. And that, that morning was Sunday, actually. And uh, another surprise that uh, was observed, uh, was uh, closely observed during the Mount Pinatubo eruption, I'm referring here to the picture on the bottom right-hand side, is the occurrence of transitional column. Transitional column have been, um, uh, can be described as column in which the pyroclastic mixture uh, in part uh, uh, continue to rise uh, uh, above, the, above the, the, the volcanic jet uh, under the action of buoyant forces and another part collapse to the ground and generate uh, uh, pyroclastic density currents. So that was a kind of uh, new dynamics that was uh, somehow also uh, non-intuitive. And another major and complex effect was the observation of the generation of major coignimbrite co-PDC plume rising from, uh, from the pyroclastic density currents. So these are just uh, two examples of unexpected and particularly complex uh, phenomena that were closely observed and that were at that time something uh, particularly new. Uh, of course, the history of volcanology um, is, uh, it's already, has already recorded a uh, um, major impact uh, uh, associated to explosive eruption. These three pictures are just examples of the, uh, of the effect uh, of, the, of three explosive eruptions. The first one associated to Vesuvio in Italy, um, produced during the 79 AD eruption of Pompeii. Uh, the other one, um, it's, a, it's a picture of uh, Saint Pierre that was completely destroyed by the 1902 eruption of Mount Pelé in Martinique, uh, during which about 30,000 people died. Uh, and the last picture referred to the 1995-2010 eruption of Sufria Hill in Montserrat, where a large part of the island, of the island was destroyed. Uh, again, by hazardous pyroclastic density currents. More recently, we have experienced uh, uh, very um, impacting uh, eruptions, uh, uh, for instance, uh, at Mount Merapi in Indonesia or at Mount Fuego in Guatemala, or more recently this year at, uh, at Tal, Mount Tal in the Philippines. So just to just to set up uh, the framework of our research, I wish to briefly mention which are the approaches, uh, the main approaches that we adopt in the investigation of the dynamics of explosive eruption and of a volcanic hazard. Um, I would say that since the 70s, it's, it's quite evident that the study of volcano dynamics and the assessment of, of hazard need to integrate altogether uh, the different methodologies uh, that have been adopted uh, to investigate uh, the volcanic system. Here I listed the, 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 the main four that uh, I identify today. Of course, the first one is the reconstruction of the eruptive record and the characterization of the eruptive style and processes that occurred at a given volcanic system. And of course, this is made by investigating the nature and the properties of the deposits uh, from this investigation, we can better understand where and what happened in a specific uh, volcanic system. The second method is based on the monitoring and observation of the present state and uh, of the present activity uh, exhibited by a volcano. In this way, we have information on when and which are the most likely precursors of some uh, volcanic phenomena. 
The third, the third approach is just about uh, the modeling, the physical modeling and numerical simulation of volcanic processes. And this kind of tools try to answer questions like how this happened, why this process happened. And uh, I wish to, to acknowledge here the pioneering work of uh, um, UK, many UK and United States colleagues that uh, um, pioneering really this kind of approach several decades ago. And of course, my lecture fits uh, today in this, uh, in this meeting. And uh, the, the fourth one, it's a more, is, is most modern approach and, is, and it is dedicated to the identification and quantification of the system uncertainties. It's, it's, it's clearly evident that our volcanic system are affected by aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. So common question we need to answer is our, how accurate is a, a given a knowledge of the volcano? How probable are specific phenomena that we could expect. So this is becoming more and more important aspect of modern volcanology. Um, and of course, the roots of the physical modeling and numerical simulation uh, are in the scientific media introduced by Galileo Galilei. The scientific, basic, the, the scientific media basically uh, consists in the use of mathematics in the description of any natural phenomena and also in the reproducibility of each experiment uh, in order to validate a, a given theoretical model. But here I have to highlight a main, uh, a main uh, um, I would say, limitation uh, of the application of, of our modeling uh, 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 studies uh, to, to volcanic system. In fact, uh, the, the model validation uh, in, in volcanology is particularly challenging. Uh, this is due to the fact that uh, we do not have uh, the control, uh, obviously, of the full-scale experiment of the volcanic phenomenon, and also we do not fully know the initial and boundary condition, as well as, for many aspects, uh, the constitutive equation that control the mechanism of our volcanic system. So this, is, uh, this limitation is always something that we should uh, keep in mind. Uh, in this slide, uh, I listed uh, some very challenging features of the dynamic of explosive eruption. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to uh, recognize that they are intrinsically three-dimensional and time-varying. So, so this means that uh, uh, typically uh, one-dimensional and a steady state description of the phenomena are, are usually strongly limited. Uh, of course, there are strongly turbulent uh, processes. So if we refer to the Reynolds number, uh, we, we, we very often uh, estimate Reynolds number of the order of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. So very high uh, turbulent regime. Uh, of course, the pyroclastic mixture are also uh, high temperature uh, mixture. So that means that the, uh, the buoyancy um, is, a, is a particularly important. So in terms of adimensional numbers, the Richardson number can vary a lot during the different uh, um, uh, um, subsystem that form uh, the, the, volcanic, uh, the volcanic phenomenon. And um, the, fourth, the fourth feature is about the compressibility uh, of, the, of the carrier fluid. So we know that the carrier fluid of, uh, of pyroclastic mixture is a gas that is strongly compressible. So that means that we uh, very often observe a, a regime that are characterized by supersonic velocity. If, if we refer to the Mach number, we can uh, often observe Mach number larger than one or even transitional uh, uh, regime. Uh, moving from subsonic to supersonic regime. And uh, last but not least, a very important feature of, the, uh, of this explosive eruption is their multiphase uh, nature. So that means that the, 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 the medium is formed by, by gas plus a wide range of particle sizes. So again, if we refer to adimensional numbers in terms of Stokes number, we can have a Stokes number much lower than one, but also Stokes number much lower than one. The Stokes number is nothing other than the ratio between the response time 
uh, of a given particle to a change in the velocity of the fluid that, that carried it uh, divided by the characteristic time uh, of the system, of the phenomenon. Uh, interesting uh, results uh, and, uh, and, and findings uh, have, been, uh, have been obtained in the last decades uh, uh, through the development and the application of Eulerian and Eulerian multiphase flow equation. In these slides, uh, um, such equation uh, have been uh, illustrated in the formulation uh, of Gidaspo 1994. And uh, this kind of uh, equation are nothing else than the generalization to uh, a multiphase system of the fundamental uh, Navier-Stokes uh, equation valid for a compressible homogeneous medium. Uh, the, 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 the main difference is that we do not have only one mass conservation, one mass uh, con conservation of momentum and one uh, conservation of energy, but we have N plus one uh, conservation equation for mass, momentum and energy, where N is the number of phases, of solid phases that we want to consider in our multi-phase flow uh, system. And um, this is possible by the introduction of a new um, a dependent variable that is, uh, that is called uh, epsilon. Um, epsilon is the volume fraction of a given phase with respect to the total volume. And uh, by the introduction of this variable, it's possible to uh, move from the microscopic density that is used in the classical uh, Navier-Stokes equation to a macroscopic uh, uh, density. Of course, there is the additional constraint that the sum of all volume fraction of all the, of all the phases considered is one. And the other additional feature of this equation is that we also have interface terms that describe the momentum and the energy transfer between gas and particle and between particles themselves of different sizes. So these are the equation uh, that we um, solve when we uh, develop uh, a, a multi-phase flow, multi flow model. And uh, in, the, in the next slide, I will show you some example of the application of this equation to some specific uh, cases. Before illustrating uh, this example, I want to highlight a, a key point of uh, explosive eruption dynamics, uh, which is the multi-scale uh, nature of explosive, uh, of explosive eruption. That means that the processes that occurs during this uh, uh, eruption um, span over a wide range of scale, from the particle scale of the order of 10 to the minus six meter up to the full scale uh, of the event of the order of 10 to the four or 10 to the five uh, meter. Okay, at the micro scale, uh, we observe processes like a collision, uh, friction between particles, and the position of particle uh, through the multiphase uh, mixture. And this kind of processes can be quite well uh, uh, described uh, through uh, universal properties uh, of the multiphase mixture. And uh, from the modeling point of view, they can be quite well described by subgrid models. So these are processes uh, that we somehow are able to describe. Uh, on the other end, member we have uh, the, the the full processes uh, at the full scale uh, of the phenomena, and and these processes are of course uh, strongly constrained by the imposed boundary conditions. That means that the condition of the vent as well as the wind uh, are, are, are processes that can strongly affect the dynamics of our uh, explosive eruption. And, and these also can be quite well described by, our, by describing the large scale dynamics. But at the same time, we also, we, we, we also need to describe uh, and to model all the um, intermediate structure the intermediate structure are particularly relevant because experimentally we can see, we, can, uh, we have learned that the fundamental processes like the entrainment of air in the, in the jet, in the plume or in the PDC 
uh, as well as the buoyancy effect are strongly controlled by structures, by main structure, by quite large structure with scale of the order of a meter of 10 of meter. So that's why in order to properly describe the dynamics of the phenomenon, we need to resolve quite well this kind of structure. And this is why uh, we need to implement in the solution uh, of the multiphase flow equation I showed you previously, a numerical, a numerical grid, a numerical accuracy of the order of a meter of, or 10 of meter, no less than that, because using, using larger grain size does not allow us to resolve, to properly resolve such important structure. So this is a very important point that we should also keep in mind. In other words, we cannot resolve directly each, uh, each uh, uh, all the scales, but we want to resolve the one that uh, basically control uh, the, the, the main feature uh, of the dynamics of, of our system. So if we move to the validation in quotas, as I mentioned before, in, in several years ago, we started from validating our multi-phase flow model uh, in 2D. Uh, a great opportunity was provided by the, uh, the Volcanian, uh, the short-lived Volcanian explosion of the Sufria Hill volcano. Uh, in 1997, and uh, in these two uh, pictures show uh, the, the evolution of the real phenomena in, in the upper picture uh, after 90 seconds from the from the explosion. And in the lower in the lower picture is instead reported the, the outcome of the of uh, our simulation, and uh, uh, we carried out uh, this simulation by imposing. Uh, a realistic uh, uh, condition, initial condition along the volcanic conduit that was uh, um, instantaneously uh, decompressed. And we were so able to link uh, the dynamics of the decompression of the conduit with the dynamics that we actually observe uh, uh, on the surface. And so several features that were observed in the real event were closely reproduced also by our 2D simulation. This is, for instance, the case of the formation of the jet, the collapse uh, uh, of the column and the generation of uh, unstable fountain, uh, the splitting of the mass between a buoyant plume and the pyroclastic density traveling along the, the, the flank of the volcano, as well as the generation of thermals uh, from uh, uh, the upper part of the PDC. So that was a quite interesting uh, and uh, a successful application of our 2D model. In the, in the later, later, in the following year, um, an, important, uh, an important progress uh, for us was to move from uh, 2D to 3D. And, uh, and an effort uh, was carried out to somehow to solve the equation I showed you before in, in fully 3D equation, taking into account also uh, the real morphology uh, of the volcano. So in, in this way, we could be able to describe the, the effect of the morphology of the volcano, for instance, on the propagation of the pyroclastic density currents, but also to describe in fully 3D condition the, the turbulence effect that characterizes explosive eruption. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, that this effort was led by Tommaso Esposte Ongaro and Mattia De Michele Vitturi, that with Amanda Clark and Barry Voigt uh, collaborating on validation studies, uh, mostly carried out uh, this uh, major progress uh, in, our, in our research work. And uh, uh, talking again about validation, a, a quite a remarkable and, and, and successful validation of our uh, 3D, new 3D multi-phase flow model um, was given by its application to the simulation of the blast uh, occurred on Mount St. Helens uh, that I mentioned before on May 18, 1980. And uh, these uh, three plots are just three uh, snapshots of the simulation and, and the comparison of, of the evolution of the of the simulated flow uh, against uh, uh, the isochrons uh, uh, of the 
uh, of the blast front. And uh, as you can uh, appreciate, uh, we, we obtained a very good uh, comparison between, uh, the observ between the observations and the, uh, and the results of the simulations, uh, as you can clearly see uh, in, in these three uh, snapshots. A main, uh, a main result of the application of this model uh, was that uh, the 3D model allows us to interpret the blast uh, as mostly a gravity-driven flow instead of uh, uh, the effect uh, of uh, an underexpanded uh, sub-horizontal jet-like flow as was previously uh, described. So this is, uh, a, as I said before, a, a kind of what we call a test uh, of, of the model, a kind of a sort of uh, validation in the terms I was mentioning before. Let's move briefly to the, um, the use uh, of this kind of models we have developed to the assessment uh, of volcanic hazard. As you probably know, Italy is one of the most exposed country in the world in terms of volcanic risk. Uh, this, is clear, this is clear from, the, from comparing the population uh, density uh, against uh, the density of volcanoes per thousand square meter. We see that Italy, together with Philippines, Japan, and the countries of Central America are, are, are the countries more, more exposed. But this is true mostly if you think about two uh, volcanoes, um, Vesuvio and Campi Flegrei Caldera, that you see here represented in these two pictures. And in these two volcanoes, due to their explosiveness uh, and also to the population density, uh, we, we, we can clearly say that uh, are probably two of the highest uh, risk volcanoes in the world uh, nowadays. And uh, just to give you a few number, we have uh, about uh, 1.2 million people uh, that could be directly affected uh, by pyroclastic density in total between the two volcanoes. And the additional 1.7 million people that could be directly affected by the fallout of volcanic ash again in total between uh, the two vo explosive volcanoes that uh, of course they are both close to the Neapolitan uh, high density in area. And uh, the other thing that we should mention is that Campi Flegrei Caldera since uh, uh, 2012 is in an arrest state, is uh, at the alert level yellow, so the second level out of four. And uh, in this slide, uh, I have uh, um, reported uh, a, a snapshot of uh, a simulation that we carried out at Campi Flegrei. And uh, in this simulation, we assume an eruptive scale uh, similar to the Plinian eruption of Agnano Montespina. Um, and uh, the, the variable reported uh, shown in this, uh, in this section uh, uh, of these snapshots uh, is the volume concentration of particle. Light color indicate higher concentration and uh, reddish and dark color indicate the lower concentration. And, um, and uh, also the, the, the flow field is also shown through, this, uh, through, this, uh, through the flow arrow patterns. And um, what I want to highlight here, I will show you also the video in a moment, is the fact that the uh, simulation uh, can actually highlight important uh, feature uh, of the phenomenon, like the formation of uh, a fountain, a strongly unstable fountain, and uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the generation of a partial uh, uh, column collapse. I mean, a column where part of the mass rise up uh, um, uh, as a buoyant plume, but most part collapse uh, to the ground. Uh, another interesting effect shown by the simulation are the generation of backflows. So part of the mixture that reached the ground is somehow recycled into the main, uh, into the main jet. Uh, in correspondence of uh, topographic relief, we can also observe a flow detaching with the fo with formation of characteristic uh, vortices, as well as the generation of uh, thermals at Koigenin-Bright clouds 
uh, rising uh, from the propagating pyroclastic density currents. During the propagation of the flow, we also observe flow stratification as well as blocking. In this case, for this specific simulation, the pyroclastic density current, current was stopped by the, by the relief uh, uh, represented by the Posilipo Hill. That is this uh, main uh, um, topographic relief that basically separated the Campi Flegrei area from, uh, from the city of Naples so that is uh, eastward with respect to, to, this, uh, to, to the Campi Flegrei uh, caldera. And uh, I want to briefly show you also the, um, the video of this uh, animation. Um, I hope you can uh, clearly see it. Uh, so this is a, a nice bird view of the, of the caldera. Uh, in this case, for this specific simulation, we assume the vent in the center of the Agnano plane, that is uh, uh, this, uh, this crater here, almost in the center of the caldera. And uh, we start the simulation. What we see here are two isosurfaces. Uh, the orange one uh, corresponds to a temperature of the pyroclastic uh, mixture of 350 degrees, whereas the pink one corresponds uh, to a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. And uh, you see that uh, after about one minute, uh, we already have uh, the formation of uh, a collapsing fountain that as we move on, we clearly see that is, uh, observe, is characterized by strong, is strongly transient dynamics and uh, by the initial uh, formation of uh, pyroclastic density currents uh, that propagate uh, uh, in, in the main uh, topographic lows uh, of the caldera. Actually, uh, the pyroclastic flow slowly, but uh, uh, actually quite fastly, uh, propagate and fill the main uh, craters uh, um, present in the central and eastern part uh, of, of the Campi Flegrei caldera. And uh, as you see, uh, the whole process is uh, relatively fast uh, since uh, almost the maximum distances uh, reached by the flow are reached in, in about 10, uh, 12 minutes. So it's an extremely a fast uh, uh, process. So if we go back uh, to our presentation, uh, I, I want to illustrate you a, 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 an additional uh, use that we have made of this uh, uh, simulation, numerical simulation uh, results that consist uh, in the integration of the simulation output with uh, uh, territorial data uh, describing uh, uh, the uh, urbanization of the region, as well as uh, all the infrastructure, buildings, roads existing uh, uh, on the territory. Uh, in this case, I will show uh, again a, a video um, that illustrates this time um, the uh, evolution of uh, a subplinian uh, eruption at Vesuvio. Uh, as before, I'm showing here the um, isosurfaces uh, of the temperature of the flow. Again, the pink correspond uh, to a temperature of 100 degree and the orange uh, temperature of 350 degree. As we see, uh, as before, we observe uh, a partial collapse of the column, the generation of pyroclastic density currents that uh, are uh, spreading all around but not uh, towards the north side of the volcano, since they are um, uh, 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 blocked by the relief of Mount Somma, that is part of the old edifice of, uh, of the volcanic system. And uh, we clearly see from this video how the topography of the volcano can actually affect the, the direction of dispersal of propagation of the PDC as well as uh, uh, we, we can appreciate the, the, how uh, the different uh, um, uh, territorial uh, uh, infrastructure are affected, uh, uh, as well as the timing uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this impact. So we have seen that this kind of visualization uh, that are particularly 
uh, effective in, also in explaining uh, the results uh, of our simulation and the expected event uh, to the general public and even to authorities. Uh, we, have, uh, we have seen uh, that this kind of uh, uh, animation are particularly effective uh, simply to, 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 to explain uh, people that are not used to volcanic system what uh, a volcano like Vesuvius could, could produce. So this is actually an additional use, an important additional use of uh, uh, numerical simulation. Uh, the last uh, use I want to mention uh, uh, of multiphase flow models is about uh, testing and uh, calibrating uh, simpler and integral models uh, that could be used for assessing uh, uh, volcanic hazard, long-term volcanic hazard in a probabilistic way. Um, we have seen, for instance, uh, talking about pyroclastic density currents, uh, that the um, uh, multiphase flow models uh, uh, can be used uh, to test and validate a simpler model. In this case, we validate uh, and then calibrate uh, the so-called box model uh, developed by Huppert and, and Simpson in 1980 uh, for the simulation of uh, dilute turbulent flow over sub-horizontal surfaces. Uh, this type of flows are, are the one we, we, um, we, we, we consider most for Campi Flegrei Caldera based on, on the stratigraphy of the, of, past, uh, of the deposit of past eruption. So in this case, uh, through the numerical simulation, we were able to um, assess the appropriateness of a simpler model and to use this simple model in a, in, in a Monte Carlo procedure. So to run thousand, thousand simulation uh, accounting for the variability of many different uh, uh, variable, uh, in, uh, variable uh, of, uh, of the volcanic system. For instance, uh, we, we consider the, the variability of the vent opening, uh, just to give you an example, or of the scale of the phenomena that we wanted to simulate. And the, the, the final outcome are maps like this one that represent, for instance, uh, uh, in this case, uh, the, the probability of PDC invasion uh, at Campi Flegrei for the next uh, uh, 50 years. And um, as you see here, uh, is represented not just the mean, uh, probabilistic hazard map, but also the fifth and the 95th percentile maps. So in other words, uh, the availability of a calibrated uh, simpler model, integral model, allow us to take into account several sources of uh, uncertainties, uh, even uncertainties on, on, the, on the volcanological field data as, as was done in this case. Okay, I will uh, we'll move in my last slides, I will move to mentioning uh, some of the uh, next challenges uh, that I see uh, we have to face uh, in, in this field. I, I listed here five of them. Uh, and I, I will start from uh, the need to improve uh, the physical formulation uh, and the constitutive equation of uh, the multiphase uh, uh, pyroclastic mixture. Of course, we do not know yet the, 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 the most accurate uh, uh, description of, of all the interaction that occur at the micro scale, uh, scale during explosive eruption. So uh, experiments and, and theoretical models are needed to come up with the most appropriate subgrid models that I was mentioning before. Uh, parallelly to this, uh, I think we need to continue to um, implement uh, and uh, uh, to implement our our multiphase flow models um, on uh, on uh, even more and more powerful uh, computers. Uh, we are now at the stage where uh, we can almost perform exascale uh, uh, numerical simulation. That means uh, we can exploit uh, computing power of the order of ten to the eighteen. Uh, floating point operation per second. So this is a, 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 an extraordinary computing power that we more and more can take, a, can take into account and can use. 
the, the third step is about uh, the testing of the model uh, against uh, a well-described volcanic event and the large scale uh, lab experiments. So this is becoming more and more um, common. It's extremely important uh, that the model uh, uh, be tested and, uh, and, and this testing has to be done in a quantitative way. And this is the best way to investigate further the multi-scale nature of this phenomena. The fourth the four challenge I would say will be in the future, uh, taking into account uh, and, and, and exploiting the, 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 super, the power of supercomputing, it will be to develop the field of the urgent computing. That means uh, to develop a real-time simulation scenario of the phenomena, uh, take into account of the available data. That means uh, by developing data simulation technique. So we can have a very uh, accurate and timely description of the expected phenomena uh, before, the occurrence, before the occurrence. And the fifth uh, uh, challenge I would say that uh, consists in the in keep on, in keep on uh, calibrating uh, uh, effective uh, reduce order and integral models in order to produce probabilistic mapping and uncertainty quantification of the different hazards associated with uh, um, explosive eruptions. Uh, my concluding remarks uh, are the following. So it's clear that major progress has occurred in volcano science in the last uh, few decades. And I would say that multi-phase flow numerical modeling has significantly contributed to this process, uh, particularly for explosive eruption. Uh, Multi-phase flow modeling has advanced both uh, our understanding of the phenomena and also has provided a quantitative assessment of the associated hazard. An important uh, contribution of, uh, uh, by, by the modeling work is the visualization of the simulation by animation. As I mentioned before, this has been particularly effective to somehow uh, illustrate uh, the complexity of volcanic phenomena to people and to authorities. Uh, the, third, uh, the third remark is that, uh, of course, the key challenges remain. We need a, a deeper understanding of the physics of volcanic processes. And also, we should have also better quantification of the main sources of uncertainties that affect our volcanic system. Uh, and I think that both challenges can be reached if we do more research. So more research is certainly needed. And uh, the last one, uh, I, I want to say that, uh, of course, I believe that uh, in, in effective uh, risk mitigation is only possible by close uh, in a closer, closer cooperation uh, between scientists, the decision makers, uh, the media, and the population at risk. And um, I want to thank you all for your attention today. And um, I also have to warmly thank my special uh, mentors and colleagues. Uh, I am indebted with Franco Barberi, Giovanni Macedonio, Dimitri Gidaspo, Peter Baxter, Willy Aspinal, and particularly with Barry Voigt, who nominated me for this prestigious award. I wish also to acknowledge a numerous group of colleagues I had the luck to work with. Tommaso, Mattia, Sara, Nicole, Paolo, Amanda, Andrea, Matteo, as well as many others I had the pleasure to collaborate with over the years. Also, I wish to thank my institute, INGV, for the opportunities and the confidence they have always had in me. Last but not least, I cannot finish this lecture without warmly thanking my family, my wife Francesca, my children Bianca and Francesco, as well as my beloved parents for all their special love, support and encouragement during all my professional life. And thank you all again for your attention today. Grazie. Well, Professor Neary, thank you so much for such a comprehensive and uh, overview um, and highlighting both the advancements in the field as well as as what's needed. So thank you so much for your 
for your excellent presentation. Um, we would love to open the floor to questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions to Professor Neary. You can uh, access the Q&A on the left side of your screen, or you can put them in the chat as well. And we'll be sure to, um, to work um, and, on and bringing them to Professor Neary to discuss. Um, but if I could take the liberty to asking the first question, you know, in, in you know, that last slide really resonated in terms of what's needed. And I guess my question is, with your expansive um, experience in the field, what still keeps you up at night in terms of our, our the gaps in our research with explosive, you know, volcanic complexes and really how that may impact society? So what are, what is still, you know, something that keeps you up at night on that topic that you want to know more about to really protect citizens? Thank you, Dalia, for your question. Uh, very, very good point. Uh, I think uh, what uh, I try to show today is how the scientific understanding of this problem is very closely related to the, to the hazard assessment. And uh, we still have a major, major uncertainty in volcanology that consists in our ability to predict uh, the, the scale and the type of the eruption uh, as a function of the monitoring signals that we record uh, through our network. So we are not yet uh, at the point where, based on our measurements, we can reasonably well predict the size and the scale of the phenomena that could occur. And you clearly understand that this is a major uh, limitation because these uh, do not allow to modulate the, the mitigation action, mostly for very high risk volcanoes like Vesuvio or Campi Flegre that I used today in my presentation. So this is really a, a major challenging issue, not just for science, but also for all the civil protection authorities. And uh, so I, I would say this is really the, 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 m m our main concern. Okay. Seth, do you, ha I, I have I a follow-up question, but yeah, please. Well, I, I had one, but I could, might be yours, the mm -hmm. same as yours. Uh, Professor Neary, what, uh, you know, many of our young people are really interested in this question of how to best work with the public authorities. In your case, that would be civil protection and groups like that. And what advice would you give, would you give young scientists who are interested in, in sort of learning to work with with the authorities based on, on your considerable experience in this area? Yeah, I think uh, in Italy, um, from this point of view, I think we are particularly lucky because we have a very strong, long lasting cooperation over, with civil protection authorities, both uh, at the national as well as the regional and local level. And uh, I think uh, the, the key point uh, to me that is the, really the most important is to understand that we, are, we all together need to uh, address uh, this very difficult problem. It's not just a matter of different responsibility, but I think we have to all together engage to this problem and try to combine all our expertise. I think everybody knows that the risk is a combination between hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. And to come up with a reasonable and a, a, a realistic estimate of, a, of the risk, you need to combine these three main components. And this integration has to be done. It's, it's extremely complex. Today, I mostly uh, present you uh, the work we have done in terms of uh, uh, hazard assessment. But this is just part of the problem, you know. Another part I didn't discuss today is how we, uh, is how we um, uh, combine the hazard output of the simulation with the information, with the vulnerability information, with the exposure information, and so on. So uh, I would say this, that this uh, um, integral and comprehensive approach is one of the key of the key point that we should always keep in mind. Um, with the final goal to provide the service and to provide the mitigation measures, you know, for all the population exposed to this uh, such a huge risk. Thank, thank you. I, I, I was going to ask a very similar question, so I guess we're Seth and I are on the same page. 
Um, uh, pivoting a bit to, um, and, and we're still, uh, please, for anyone who's interested, please submit questions. We're, we're monitoring the chat for, for your questions um, on Professor Neary's presentation. You know, going to validation, um, you know, I'm curious what you think the role might be in satellite data either now or in the future with new opportunities for evaluating or providing validation to constrain some of the numerical modeling. Um, you know, are we there yet with the relevance of satellite data to really understand the dynamics of these complexes, either probabilistically or, you know, in the full modeling suite with data simulation? Or do we have a ways to go? And if so, what what needs to happen? No, no, this is a very, thank you for this question. It's a very good point because, you know, data coming from satellite, from remote sensing, it's already uh, largely exploded nowadays, uh, either for the monitoring of the volcanic system during quiescent and arrest period, but also in observing the real phenomena. A simple example is the dispersal of volcanic ash. We already have, uh, we are already taking advantage of the many observations with a, with a variety of satellites we, we can already carry out. And we are already able to use uh, several of these uh, models and, and information to inform the models even during the occurrence of the, of the phenomena. Just recently, we have published uh, some paper uh, in which we basically assimilate uh, information coming from uh, uh, satellite uh, remote sensing to inform the source condition that uh, uh, generate uh, volcanic uh, ash cloud. And this, uh, as you understand, is particularly important also for, uh, also for uh, predicting where the ash could go and, and, and therefore to inform all the air traffic authorities as well also the, the civil protection authorities. So I think in the future this will be a huge field of major development. As, you, as, as I try to show, we have a lot of data coming out of this, from the simulation. These are virtual data that need to be combined with a similar 3D representation that more and more can be gained by by remote sensing observation. Not just remote sensing, even ground-based ground, uh, ground -based observation and measurements are becoming more and more effective and, 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 uh, and, um, and useful. So, so, so I think this is extremely important because validation need data. So we need all this data. We need to describe the evolution of the phenomena as I explained in 3D and, and in time. So, this is something that we really look forward to. And I think in the future, it will be very important to, to have some very detailed uh, description of, uh, of, of the future eruptions, I mean, of some test case, to be, so that we can use them as a test case. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Seth, do you want to ask? I see we have a comment in the chat. Or do you want me to? Sure. I can, let, me ask, let, me ask, let me ask a hard question. Um, Italy, you know, your group in Italy and, and your colleagues, of course, have led the way in terms of effective interaction with the civil authorities. And at the same time, Italy has excellent, excellent seismologists, but things have not gone as well. <laughs> and I know that you, of course, w w can you give us some insight into, you know, perhaps how the, how it might work better on the seismological side from, based on what you've learned from the volcanological side? Uh, this is this is a different. I know question. it's a hard question. I know it's a hard question. Yeah, yeah. It's. Um, I think any of this uh, relation can also depend on, on the past history of, of the country, of the past record of disasters, or or you know specific situation that could have occurred, and of, and of course they also depend on the on the specific uh, hazard that we are considering. Uh, volcanic hazard is a very specific one because we uh, are able somehow to forecast and predict and elaborate a different time scale which could be the future evolution of, of the volcano. And this, uh, this process uh, requires you to interact very closely 
with the with the with the civil protection people. So to advise them uh, frequently and in time. So I think one very important thing that we have in Italy is that we have a well-established relationship, cooperative uh, relationship with the civil protection people, mostly at the national level. Just because we all uh, understand uh, that. Uh, the problem we have to face is so huge that we can uh, really have uh, uh, um, some, uh, some chance uh, to contribute to, to its solution just if we work together and in close cooperation. Uh, so I, I, I really believe that uh, cooperation is the key word, not just between scientists and civil protection authorities, but also with civil but also with the citizen that are at risk and also with the media. I think we cannot uh, communicate a, a, anything minimal, meaningful without the cooperation and, uh, 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 with the media, with the journalists, you know, so, so that uh, effective and accurate information could be communicated to the people. I think this is another important aspect that I think it's quite clear even nowadays with this pandemic uh, crisis, you know, how much important it is to, to communicate effectively what we know, what we expect, but also what we don't know, you know, to communicate effectively the uncertainty that are in our system, and it's a really a key point to me. Everybody, all of us, I think we should learn more how to do that. I think that's an excellent point to leave this discussion on um, the role of of science communication and linking research with an understanding of what societal needs and benefits could be. With that, thank you so much, Professor Neri, for your excellent lecture. Thank you for those that participated. And, um, and please stay tuned for the other excellent natural hazard sessions we have throughout, uh, throughout this AGU. So thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you soon. And thank, thank you. you again for Professor this and thank you for attending today. Thank you very much.